Our second scripture reading is Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 8 and 15 through 22, and chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. Before I read these scriptures, I will be um, reading here in the pulpit, but preaching down in the chancel. And I know some of you really, really prefer me to stay in the pulpit when I preach, and some of you really, really prefer me to be down here in the chancel. So we'll just mix it up a little bit this summer and trust that God will minister to all of us wherever the preacher may be. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land where you are now an alien, all the land of Canaan, for a perpetual holding, and I will be their God. God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her and also give you a son by her. She shall give rise to nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Can a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Can Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, oh, that Ishmael might live in your sight. God said, No, but your wife Sarah shall bear you a son and you shall name him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I've heard you. I will bless him and make him fruitful and exceedingly numerous. He shall be the father of 12 princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this season next year. And when he had finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. The Lord dealt with Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to his son, whom Sarah bore him. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Now Sarah said, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, who would ever have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Old age. There is no denying that a number of of us right here, right now, are smack dab in the middle of old age. And the rest of us will get there eventually if we're lucky. If we are there already, we are in good company. Since 62 million adults in the United States right now are age 65 or older. That's 18% of the population. 
And if you read my message in our most recent weekly email, you learned, if you didn't know already, that three out of five members of the Presbyterian Church USA are 55 and older, and about a third are age 71 or older. Today we're beginning a new message series called Generational Blessings about the unique power and potential of older adults. And here's, here's the story about how and why this particular series came about. It is not because of the recent presidential debate, although perhaps that event and its fallout makes this series even more timely. So back in the fall of 2022, I wrote a week's worth of devotionals for The Upper Room, which annually publishes a book of devotions for each day of the year. It's called The Upper Room Disciplines. And I was assigned some scriptures for the first or second week of Lent for 2024, and one of those scriptures was <clears throat> one of the passages from Genesis that we just heard about God making his covenant with Abraham and Sarah in their old age. So I wrote about that. <clears throat> I said, like many Presbyterian pastors, I serve a congregation where the older members far outnumber the younger ones. This is not news to any of you, right? That over the years I've watched as more members need to use canes and walkers to navigate their way through the sanctuary, while other members no longer worship in person at all because it simply hurts too much to sit in these pews. I wrote that I have lost track of the number of times I have heard the question, what are we doing to attract younger members? I pointed out that Abram was 99 years old when the Lord gave him the name Abraham, meaning father of nations, and Sarah was 90. They are painfully aware of the their ages, and the limitations that come with them. Yet God calls and chooses these older adults and promises to make them not just fruitful, but exceedingly fruitful. They see their ages as an obstacle. God sees an opportunity. So I asked the question, <clears throat> instead of viewing old age as a liability, what if we viewed aging as an opportunity to let God make us more fruitful? What if we focused on celebrating the older adults among us and treating them as the asset they truly are? And I described how I've been blessed by the abundant gifts of the older adults and the congregations I have served. So <clears throat> that devotion was published for February 19th of 2024. And shortly after February 19th this year, something interesting started to happen, which was I received some fan mail from a few individuals who really liked it. Not, not a lot, but, but hey, it was fan mail. A couple of cards, a couple of emails, even a phone call from somebody, I think maybe in Oregon. And I had written a whole week's worth of devotionals, but February 19th was the clear favorite. And I should also point out that as I preach on this topic over the next few weeks, sometimes you'll hear me say we, because I'll be turning 55 this week, which means I can join the spark plugs and order off the 55-plus menu at Perkins. So I'm approaching this sermon series aware of how I myself am aging, yet mindful that I will forevermore seem pathetically young to some of you. And speaking of young, <clears throat> we really do seem to worship youth here in the United States. I've been reading a very interesting book this week called Breaking the Age Code, how Your Beliefs About Aging Determine How Long and Well You Live by Becca Levy. And one not-so-fun fact I learned is that we Americans tend to have much more negative views about aging than other cultures. That's one reason that the global anti-aging industry generates nearly $200 billion a year in profits just from 
the part of that industry that aims to help with wrinkles. Among the many articles about last week's debate was one by Dr. Rachel Bettered in the New York Times called The Struggles of President Biden and the Truth About Aging. She wrote, ours is a culture that greatly undervalues the potential contributions of older people who have so much to offer in terms of care, mentorship, and experience, and instead consistently portrays them as burdensome. When I went to South Korea last summer with my young daughter, Rachel, I saw something completely different. When, whenever we were seated for a meal with our South Korean hosts, the younger people would always serve the older ones. Now, for the entirety of our relationship, me and Rachel, I have been the one to serve her because that is what moms in the United States do. That's what we do. But Rachel is no dummy. And she quickly realized how rude she would look if she did not serve me. So for three glorious days, <laughs> Rachel spooned food onto my plate and made sure my water glass stayed full. It was fantastic. <laughs> and short-lived since we immediately reverted back to our old pattern once we left. But it was eye-opening to be someplace where ordinary older people are routinely honored instead of overlooked or made fun of. The story of Abraham and Sarah is a powerful one in part because the story we heard today was not the first time God spoke to Abraham. God first called Abram 25 years earlier when Abram was 75, saying, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. So this is a man who keeps trusting God even as he keeps getting older and older and his wife's reproductive years become a distant memory. If Abraham had been a younger man, God's power in his and Sarah's lives would not have shown through this brightly. And it is in the patient, long-suffering faith of this one older man that three of the world's great religions, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, all have roots. In an earlier story in chapter 15, Abram is in his 80s, and he's starting to get a little anxious that he's still childless, and he has this vision where God leads him outside and says, look toward heaven and count the stars if you can. So shall your descendants be. Scripture says that Abram believes the Lord, and it is credited to him as righteousness. In his belief, this aged nomad becomes a role model for the rest of us to keep trusting God and persevering in doing what God asks us to do even when the world thinks we are nuts. For example, to forgive our enemies instead of retaliating. Returning good for evil. Helping those who cannot repay us. Giving thanks in all circumstances. Whatever stage of life you find yourself in right now, silver, gold, platinum, or just starting out, I invite you right now to see older adulthood as an opportunity to be a role model, to lean on God as never before, to see old age as a time when God can make us not just fruitful, but exceedingly fruitful, to know that we still have so much yet to give. In the weeks to come, we will be looking at the unique gifts and qualities that older adults can offer. 
We will learn about ways nearly all older adults can make a positive impact in the lives of others. We will explore the toxic effects of ageism in our world, including in our churches, and how to counteract them. We will talk about how to defy the negative stereotypes and be the kind of older adult that younger people long to have in their lives. And spoiler alert, this actually applies to all of us at all stages of adulthood. We will talk about how we can build bridges between generations because there are very, some very deep and dangerous gaps right now. And if we have time, we'll also explore where God is on the journey of dementia and Alzheimer's. So that is what is coming up in the weeks ahead. And again, this is a message series for all of us, not just older adults, because guess what? Gen X, millennials, and Gen Z, every day, we are making choices about the kind of older adults we will someday become. Right now, today, we're creating our own future. May the body of Christ and may this congregation be the role model the world needs to see the image of God in people of all races, all genders, all shapes, all sizes, all stages and ages of life.